Hi, this is Paul Roberts, and this is Conscious Counseling 101. And this video is really for everybody, but it's really, I'm making it right now because I have some people in my family that I love, and I want them to understand something about myself more. But this something, if I reveal it to them, it will help be helpful to many. So I'm gonna go back to when I was like in first grade, maybe even before first grade. And I went to um, um, a church, pre-Methodist church up in uh, near Detroit. And um, I stood up in church, and it was in the evening uh, service we were at. And I said, I love Jesus. And the whole congregation thought that was great. I was a little baby, you know, like a, like a little baby. Um, and they, they all, you know, made appropriate noises. I remember this to this day, and I, that far back. And, you know, amen and whatever they, they, they would do. And then I stood up another time, and I think it was the same service, and said, they were talking about, what if a robber breaks into your house and accosts you or whatever? And I stood up as a child, could barely speak, could barely speak, and I said, I would speak to him, and I would say, don't you understand what you're doing is wrong? And Jesus came for people like you to give you opportunity and to save you. And if you don't take what he offers and live according to it, um, you will be put into hell and you will be in suffering and agony and you won't even have any water or anything like that. And I didn't get quite as good of a reaction, I think, from the crowd. But, but, but my point of bringing this up is, at this early tender age, I, think, I don't think that John was even born. It's possible he was, but he was like in a crib or something, and David was maybe crawling around. At this tender age, it wasn't what so was important then, but looking back at it now, I say to myself, oh my gosh, that's the perspective that I came up with and acknowledged. The fact that my, my desire to serve and to follow was motivated out of a taught instinct to avoid retribution, to avoid hell and agony. It wasn't about love and about the wonder, seeing all the wonderful things that Jesus did so much as to a child, it was about the avoidance of hell. Now, the children that came to Jesus when he was on this planet, it wasn't about that. It was about, look at these wonderful things that he's showing us and telling us. So today, when you talk about my words, my words, my goal is to be like those children that came to Jesus when he was on earth and wanted to find out what he said. My goal is to be completely in alignment with those words and not to be out of it and to help anybody else that would be in alignment with those words. But sometimes what you're seeing that you call, I think John, my brother, said it only works if you think of it as his way. When you see anything and you review it as my words, either I'm lacking in mirroring Jesus and I need to be rebuked and I, and I welcome that. I, I, I look for that every day of my life to find a, re a rebuke that is worthwhile, that is putting me more in keeping with Jesus' words. But a lot of times when you think it's my words, it's not my words. It's me going back and seeing how I came to see and how showing potential brothers that it isn't about avoidance of negative ramification that we should be motivated to, to seek Jesus and follow his ways. It should be motivated by what he showed. And so when you hear anything that's my words, it's about trying to help make that distinction. Because I've seen in my life, and I believe, that much of mankind runs towards religion and church not for the value that is shown there, but for seeking safety of the soul and the afterlife. So whenever you see it close enough to what I'm thinking, or you think, oh, that's what Paul thinks, and you think somehow it's off of Jesus, the only reason that you're seeing that is because that's so powerful resonating in my life that I can go back to my childhood right at this moment and see how I entered the door and what I originally thought by what the church offered. Now, it wasn't that the church said anything that was out of keeping with Jesus' words. No, no, not at all. But that was the powerful statement. 
And that's not the powerful statement that I read in my Bible when Jesus shows his ways to the world. Now, you do have the words uh, that Jesus said about, you know, when the weeds grew up um, and when somebody planted some weeds amongst us. What should we do, Master? And, he, and you do have the words that say, let them grow up and along with the good. And then later we will sort them and throw them into the fire. Okay? You do have that. So it's there, the suggestion of hell is there, but it's not the focus. So when you look to my interpretation, what's Paul's interpretation? Paul's interpretation, or desire to interpret and share with others, is to be exactly on what the context and meaning of the words were. Now, in order to do that, you have to understand the entire Bible. You have to understand both Testaments and how one covenant was failed by the Jews and how today the law lives on, no stroke is taken away or added to, and then now we have a different thing where we're not... We're not offered prosperity and long life and all health and everything like that if we follow. Uh, we are not even going to be offered peace necessarily like those people would have if they had done what God asked. So in that context, which is represented in the Bible, and it's very loose in general, it's not really, it's not really that hard to come by if, if you read everything. There I present myself. There's where I present myself and what I see. So when I look at a concept of where did hell come from, you know, um, I look outside of Jesus' words. It's mentioned, you know, let me dip my finger in water. Uh, no, there's a great chasm between you and this and you can't go there. The concept of hell um, is, is other places. But the hugeness of it offered in the formalized church that I came up in was my motivation. So I knew there was a problem with that. And so, so much of what Paul says is trying to avoid that problem for others because I knew that when I saw when Jesus came in his words and how he came to people, that that's not how he approached them and that's not how people approached him. So that one little thorn, you know, that we call that splinter, I have to have a whole life about Jesus so that I can Remove the plank from my eye and take that small splinter out because that splinter is huge. So when you hear me talk, John, the reason it seems like it's so huge and I'm insinuating like words like that that you use and it's got to be Paul's way and his interpretation. The reason why you're seeing that is because of that stepping stone I had to get over and learn the full context of how off that presentation was. And even though I came and I asked for the door to be open and I've walked that walk, it shouldn't have been that way. So when you hear about Paul and what Paul's trying to do, it's show that. That's mostly the thing. Then when you're showing that and you're in the context of Jesus' words, my concept of showing what those words mean is not that far outside of anything. The biggest thing that I'm outside about, and this is why I call into account my family and everything and where I came from, is that when Jesus says, whenever two or more are gathered in his name, there is love. And when Jesus talked to Peter uh, and he said on the cross, this is where I will build my church. The concept that people have today of a church is formulated by being in a mass, in a group, in a formalized place. And that is reinbolstered and forced their whole life. That's what I speak to because out of that comes an essence of a continuation on of what the chosen people were doing, building that important um, worship place in, in the wilderness and finally in the final place that they built it. And we're trying to still emulate that today, but we are not those people. We are grafted on and finally, Jesus saw the one woman underneath the table that wanted the crumbs um, and said, I, wow, this is, this is worth, I didn't come for you, but I'm going to take time for you and show you, share this with you. Well, we're like that woman. If we see that what he has, even though it wasn't for us, is so important, then it becomes for us. And those that it was for don't even get it. And that's why they lose even what they have. And those that had nothing gain. But when you, when you turn that over, those that have little, well, everything will be taken away. And those that have, more will be given. 
we're talking in the context of coming to Jesus, coming to see that that's everything, and then more will be given. So the reason why I am so about this message being put out there is because it's already there. But some people, I don't want to use the word wrong, but some people aren't getting the focus. Just the focus. We're all, we all know, we read the same Bible. And it's not even so much the interpretation. It's the focus. The focus is, do you come because you want your soul saved and you want to avoid the negatives? Or do you come because the light shines and you want that and you want everyone to see that? If that's the focus, that's a worthy journey. When I see other people that I feel as though that focus is slightly off of, that's when Paul comes out and says, what can Paul do? What can Paul do? Jesus has already done the work. What can Paul do as a humble servant to direct it to that? So I borrow from my biggest tool in my chest and say, this is how I came. I spent a life of realizing why how I came wasn't the way. So that's what Paul has to offer. It's It really fits in a really tight package. I know it seems all pervasive too, but it really fits in a really tight package. So, and I know it, it's like really like written on my heart and you know, the words are above my door frame and it's all I think about because it was so buried in that early child boy that saw in spite of all that and still came. So that's why it seems so big. Anyway, those are my thoughts on it. And when I came to see consciousness and the light were one and the same of the Word and the Holy Spirit and Jesus and God, the welcoming of that, the welcoming of that was the most powerful thing I've ever seen in the world. I'm just thankful that not having the thing that I was so aware of that my mouth spewed out as a child because the other stuff was there too. The other stuff was there too and it all pervaded through my blessed grandparents and parents that took me to there to be there amongst that word and offer that to, to me when I wouldn't might, might not have heard it otherwise or saw it in a really jaded context from humanity. The shining still came through, but I perceived first the negative. Only when later in my spiritual walk, I got past the negative and saw, did I then give that to my family. Only in the positive manner of what Jesus wants. And everybody else that I talk to, I show that. So we don't talk about negative retribution. We talk about the good word we talk about the meaning of the light and all that was given to us through the living word and the Holy Spirit and Jesus and God and his intended purpose for all mankind, but then eventually it came to us. That's what my words are about. And if you say, this is what Paul thinks, well, that's what you're talking about. Because every single thing else is right there and we have it accessible to all of us. So that's where it stops. I know it seems large, because I'm impassioned about it and I lived through it and came up across in my spiritual walk across what I thought was a huge to me a, a huge paradigm shift that needed to be made of the viewing of the thing and the seeing you could call artsy one I want to compare that just for a second artsy one it's not oh you see it my way or not at all no the reason I call myself artsy one is because when I went to college I went to a an art school and the main concept was, the emperor's new clothes, is artsy fartsy stuff real? Or is skill and transference of something that you're trying to say to another individual real? I call myself artsy one because I made a judgment, and you're allowed to judge in the physical realm <laughs> when your profession and whatnot. God just doesn't want you to judge fellow brethren and people because they're potential people that could be lifted. But I made a judgment that the emperor wasn't wearing any clothes. And I said it out loud in my screen name, and I say it out loud now. So much of what people are trying to do is artsy-fartsy. And it's spelled S-Y. And it's not really possessing of something grand. 
And so I named myself Artsy One because I made that sight observation. Just like as a child, I made the observation of you shouldn't come to him because you're avoiding hell. You should come to him in love and seeing the divine wisdom and insights and consciousness and light that he has suffered and died for. And it's a part of the trueness of the grandioseness of the infiniteness of God in the universe. And no, I shouldn't even say the universe because <laughs> he might have made a little model to him for us to all live in, no matter how big it seems to us. I shouldn't even say the universe. But I get tripped up on my own words because other people that are around me say those things and I try not to. So if you want to rebuke me, rebuke me about, oh, shoot, he stumbled on a man point of view. He stumbled on a, a word that somebody else used. We're not to look and put our faith in man. Um, but everything that we need can be arrived at by the word and by the Holy Spirit and by our impassioned emboldenedness to follow and serve. And so that's what I'm about. So to even have a conversation where we say, I don't, you know, I, don't listen to this guy because he's like trying to mold and bend. No, I'm offering myself up as a humble servant of where my life is a tool that can an insight can be brought from because I lived it. That's one of the things I have to give. If I didn't do that, if I wasn't about that, then my concern would be that I buried my talent in the ground and we know that the master's not pleased with that. So I hope you understand the distinction more and why I live the way I do. Um, but in love, we can do so much more for our fellow brethren. They're not just in the place we gather on Sunday. They're everywhere, and you haven't even met them all yet. I have a desire to do that, and I'd love it if we'd all do it together. I would, and I'm, I'm always lined up for that. All right, guys. Have a blessed new year. Know that you're thought of and loved constantly, even if you don't think of the miles are insurmountable or whatever. You don't necessarily think that you are. You still are. <laughs> and the I have my uh, thank you, Aunt Paulette and Uncle Leonard, for my slides. I got a nice little viewer so that I, I can look at them. Um, and reflect back at the times of my loving family and upbringing that brought me to the Lord. Uh, and I'm just thankful for my analytical nature that's seen some of the things that need to be pulled out and purged so that the next person has an even more welcome road to the Lord. And if I'm going to write a book or I'm going to show anybody something, it would be that because my life experience has revealed it to me. And so that's what I offer. So I hope you understand that that's how I got that. Um, and it's not judgmental. It's how can I go, <laughs> like John the Baptist, I guess. He's a role model. And help pave the way so that others that come after me don't stumble on things that I could have if I wasn't fortunate. and My name wasn't written in the book. And didn't have people that loved me and supported me. And I could have stumbled on those things. But I didn't. And I don't want others to. And so that's what I'm about. Okay, guys, nice talking with you. I hope you take time to, to listen to these words. I know that if you spent five hours making a video, I would absorb every minute of it. I'd love it. Do it. <laughs>